to the blue. All right, gang. Hey, it's Pastor Bill in KFLK, and I am here with a friend, Sarah Troyer. I've known Sarah for, we think, about five years now. Uh, Sarah is part of the River of Life Assembly of God here in Minot, but she's also, and maybe even more so, a missionary. Uh, she's been in at least nine different countries that we know of, um, <laughs> but recently came back from Uganda, which happens to be uh, near and dear to my heart, as we're working on a project there. Um, but she's come in the studio to share her testimony and just to share what God is doing and, and maybe even stir up your hearts for missions. You know, Jesus said in, in Acts chapter 1 that we were to be his disciples in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And uh, Sarah is one who's taken that very seriously on the local, the regional, and international fronts. So, good morning, Sarah. Good morning. All right. Thank so, you so much. Oh, my pleasure. It's our honor to have you here. Mm. That is that is the truth. So, uh, tell me what's going on in your life currently. Where have you been, and what's God been doing? Yes, this is exciting. This is my favorite topic. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yes, thank you so much for having me here. I just got back from Uganda, actually. And Uganda was my first time going to anywhere in Africa, and it was amazing. Uh, it was also my very first time going overseas by myself. So I had a lot of peace about it, but once I arrived, it was a little scary. Mm. Um, but God definitely worked through that and he, man, some of the things he did in just showing his heart for people is so encouraging to me every single time that I go, uh, knowing that, you know, his, God's heart is everywhere and his heart is for people, for souls. So, uh, I'd love to share just a, a, a little bit of what happened in Uganda and, um, kind of what I did there. Sure. So. Um, so the, the main purpose was to train pastors and leaders and, uh, we trained them on how to share the gospel, how to share their testimony, how to lead others to Christ, and then how to lead Bible study, how to, uh, lead them into a Bible study and give them a vision to plant churches where there are none. Sure. You know, you make a great point here. You go and you help train pastors because a lot of people here in America don't realize that in the in the in the third world in developing countries that that when a church is planted often the leadership changes fairly rapidly yes something happens and the next guy steps up but he doesn't necessarily have the training the experience the insight or the support right. to really be able to to be used to solidify the group and move it forward yes so yes you're out yeah. there doing these very things <laughs> yes and it's I, I caught this this vision when I lived in the Philippines for a year was just really the the father's heart and you know I work with CMC which stands for Church Multiplication Coalition and their heart and their mission is really that they believe Jesus deserves to be worshiped by every person Amen. right and uh, their heart is you know to have a church in every village and how they do this is working together with local pastors and leaders training them how to do this how to lead people to christ and and then how to disciple them and with the hopes of you know eventually having a church there and so uh it's it's just really amazing because it the the grander vision of that is that everybody would have an opportunity to hear about yeah, jesus absolutely church multiplication yes seems almost biblical doesn't it <laughs> yes unity i mean i mean the the heart is unity within believers because Jesus said, you know, you you do these things until, I think maybe it was Paul. Mm. Um, he said, you know, we work together until we all come into unity yeah, in Christ absolutely. Jesus. Yeah. And uh, so... Ephesians chapter 4. Yes. Sure. Yep. Um, and, and so, you know, the heart is that we need to work together right. because the mission of reaching every person for Christ is way too big for only one person, yeah. for one ministry. One denomination for that matter, exactly. right? Exactly. I mean, right, absolutely. Yes. And I understand that there are differences, but mm -hmm. we have to be able to work past those as God's people. Yes. For the sake of the gospel. Amen, yeah, amen. That is for sure. So tell me uh, some of the testimonies, what's gone on in your most recent trip in Uganda. Yes, <laughs> so I just got back from Uganda uh, in, in December, a little bit before Christmas. 
So, uh, man, there's so much that happened. And the first story I want to share, really, is uh, this one church. There were around 200 pastors and leaders that showed up for the meeting. And so when we do a meeting that, you know, lasts pretty much all day, we usually provide lunch. Otherwise, especially in Africa, they won't eat that day. So um, we, the, the leader of this group, the, the pastor of this church, told the pastor that was hosting me that we don't want to buy any food. We want to use the money that you want to use for food and use it to buy cement to build, make the church bigger. Mm. And that is unheard of in Africa. Mm. Seriously, like sure. food is, it, it's a big thing. Like you offer food, of course we're going to accept right. food. And, but it just really uh, showed me how hungry they were for the word. And the pastor even said, you know, we don't want to eat because it'll just be a distraction. We should just do the training straight through. <laughs> right? Food, you eat, well, you get I, tired. I fast just to, for blood work and I'm just dying because you know? <laughs> I, I couldn't eat from midnight or something. Till... <laughs> yeah. So uh, it, it just really encouraged me. And the amazing thing is, you know, when we got there, they already duck out the part where they want to make the church bigger. They did everything they can mm. with what they had, and now they're just waiting on the Lord to provide for the building project. Right. And to me, it's like, wow, they're you know they're really serious about this. And God really moved through that church. Man, they were there at eight in the morning, and when we left at five p.m., they were still there. Sure. <laughs> so they were definitely very hungry, and so when. It, I think I trained for like five hours straight in this church. Nobody went outside to do something else. They didn't stop for snacks. They didn't take time to, well, you know, it's kind of hot in here and I'm tired. Let me go outside. Check, check their Facebook. Right. <laughs> no Facebook. <laughs> um, so it was really amazing. They stayed in there and even until the very end. And I love to show you a video of their energy at the very end as we were closing out. Um, so it just really blessed my heart to see the hunger and it made me question, like, am I really that hungry for God? Am I that hungry for, for the word and, and to learn, you know? Um, but it, yeah, it just really blessed me to see them. And then, oh, I, I have to share this one. I shared it on my Facebook, but a story about Mama Rose. So if any of you know who Amy Carmichael is. Uh, and if you don't, I suggest you look her up. She's an amazing woman that served in India as a single missionary. And anyway, so this Mama Rose, she reminded me of Amy Carmichael. She, at almost 30 years old, was single, had no kids, had no husband, no family. And that's kind of a big deal there. Sure. And so she, God gave her a dream. And in the dream, she had a whole a bunch of children so many children got told her I'm gonna give you more children than you know and they're gonna come from people that you don't expect so she had that dream and at 30 years old God started bringing children in and because of her willingness her willing heart to say yes to God through you know receiving that dream she uh, at the age of 60 years old I don't know how many she doesn't know how many kids have come through her house but at the age of 60 today she currently has 30 children that she's taking care of plus her mother amazing <laughs> and her heart is just to raise up these children in the lord mm. and it's amazing too because she has four acres there that she the children help raise their own food so they provide for themselves yeah. it's self-sustainable right yeah and these guys don't even have a church with a roof they worship under a bunch of trees, rain or shine. <laughs> I love it. It's, just, it's convicting, though. Yes. Because <clears throat> we think we need, you know, air conditioning and mm -hmm. stained glass and all this stuff. And you're like, no. Yes. You know, the, the Father's heart is there as much as it is anywhere else. Right? Yes, it is. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, going back to that church with the 200 people, this was, this church was packed full of people with no air conditioner, hardly any breeze coming through. And it is super hot in Uganda. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it smells like sweat. And it's like, and I walk out of that church and I'm thinking to myself, wow, I go to America and I sit in a service for two hours and I think, man, it's kind of long. 
I have padded seats. I have right. heat or air conditioning. And I can't focus for more than two hours. Very convicting. <laughs> uh, it, no, it is. But, but what you're saying then is that in Uganda, there are brothers and sisters there who are hungry for God's word. Yes. Who, who want people to come over, who want to be trained, who want to be poured into so they can continue the perpetuation of the yes. gospel. Amen. Amen. But how can you not go? Amen. How can you? It would be disobedient <laughs> to not go almost, wouldn't it? Yes. I mean, these people need <clears throat> us. They need you. Um, yes. It's in a different church, you know, after we after we did the training, uh, there were some questions that came up and and some of them were like we really really want to continue this, you know, and but how can we if we don't have a Bible mm -hmm. or if we don't have this or we don't have that? And, and the truth is all you need is Jesus. Right. Um, and sometimes we get caught up in, not that money doesn't help us go, but sometimes we get caught up in what we don't have to use an excuse to not do it. Right. Instead of looking at what we already have and using, starting with that, right. you know, because God can multiply. For sure. <laughs> yeah. What's God given you already? You know, the truth <laughs> is, I, yes. I mean, I see people who, who express an interest to go on the mission field, but they don't want to go unless somebody's paying the bill and I'm like right but God has given you a job and yes he's provided for you already what, what's the you know, mm -hmm. come on now what's God given you let's begin there at some point we have to step out in faith yeah absolutely faith is mm. a very very big part of this journey sure so <laughs> some great highlights yes but how about some of the low lights some of the heartbreaking Ooh. things because a lot of times people think about the mission field oh yeah I'll go and I'll share the gospel and people get saved and that's true but a lot of times there's heartbreaking things yeah as well very very good question mm -hmm. so i would say one of them was i was a little disappointed that not everything went as i had planned <laughs> <laughs> that's the ministry yeah that's visions <laughs> yes um and you know we we did because of the way africa is in the places we went to we ended up spending a lot of time driving which okay that's fine but you know i had my mind set on i'm gonna train as many churches as I can. We're going to go to as many places as we can. And that ended up not really happening. Like we had maybe four different churches that hosted meetings. Now, now there were pastors from other churches from all over. Uh, some of them traveled a hundred kilometers. Right. 60 to come, miles. Yeah. Yeah. To come in for these trainings. So, um, I would say that was probably one of them. And another was, I had been warned of the great need, that there is a, a really big need in Africa. Um, but to see a child, and it's not the child's fault, but they're malnourished, sure. and you see the hunger in their eyes. And that was a little bit, uh, in the moment, I didn't really process it, I guess, but afterwards thinking about it and just going, wow. How, how can I fulfill such a great need? Right. You know, um, in some of these children that are orphans and they don't have a mom and a dad uh, and they're just trying to make it. Right. Hearing the pastor's testimony of how he grew up, he, he was kicked out of his house basically because he became a Christian. Um, and having to fend for himself because even his parents didn't have much. Uh, I, Yes, there were there were lows. Sure. But I think because I set my heart so much on the highs, I mm -hmm. forget about the lows. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> no, but you know, I think some that we go on the mission field to have our hearts broken too. There's to share the gospel, but our hearts have to be broken. We we we, we live in a in a strange reality in the western world and especially in America. And that's why I like to get out every few years. I have to just mm -hmm. to get back to the real reality of what's going mm -hmm. on out there. Yeah. And, you know, I, I like that you spoke about the, you know, breaking, our hearts mm -hmm. being broken. Because just a couple of days ago, I was doing my devotional, and that was my, my prayer was, God, I can't be so afraid of being hurt and broken right. that I'm constantly trying to protect myself. Right. No, like, I broke the Father's heart when I was living in sin. Sure. When I was running away from Him, I broke His heart. So I want my heart to be broken for what breaks His. Right. I want to be... Um, broken for 
the, the chaos that's going on, you know? Lost people that, people that don't know. Right, they've never heard the gospel they, or, yeah. sure. They don't, they don't have the opportunity to, to know Jesus. I want my desire for that to be so much greater than the desire to try to protect myself. <laughs> I get it. I get it. Yeah. No, I, I applaud you for it, you know. So. I have to share this one story. Please do. <laughs> so this is more of a funny story, but it brought in the humor in the middle of just seeing the grave meat. So I am the only white person in, there for miles around, right? And some of these kids, uh, the pastor, we, we, we met with like 20 kids, and the pastor asked them, have you ever seen a white person before? And most of them said no. Because again, these, these kids don't have TV. Sure. They don't have phones to see it. And so even even virtually, they've never seen a white person. So they're right. just like amazed. And <laughs> so the fun funny story is after one of our meetings, we were dropping off one of the pastors and he wanted us to come in for a little bit. So we, we got out of the car. And as I walked around the back of the van, I there's a little kid standing over here. And I don't think anything of it. You know, by now I'm so used to people staring at me. It doesn't, sure. doesn't bother me. But as I walked around, I see him and I keep walking. And, I, and then I, as I'm walking, I said, hi. And I kid you not, this is no exaggeration. He puts his hand out, backs away, and screams. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to scare you. And I looked at the pastor and he's laughing. And I said, do you think he thinks I'm an alien or something? Mm. Or maybe he didn't think that we speak? I don't know. But it was funny. Sure. <laughs> I'm like, oh, this poor kid. He was some white person. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I'm speaking a foreign language to him, too. And sure. Yeah, it was, Still, it was funny. Still, uh, the heart of a child. I mean, just, yes. you know. Yes, absolutely. Nice. <laughs> so, um, you know, uh, let's switch this up a little bit. You know, some of you listening may notice that Sarah has a slight accent. Uh, it's 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 no just way. it's ever so slight. <laughs> but um, you know, a, a lot of us think, well, you know, what could I possibly do? You know, I'm from this background. I'm from that background. I, I'm going to ask Sarah to share your background a little bit and let people know uh, who you are. Hmm. Who am I? It's a rather <laughs> complex question. And <laughs> it's a very uh, popular question that we, I, I find we get asked a lot here in the Western world. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, it doesn't matter who I am. Wow. I, <laughs> I didn't see that one coming. <laughs> but I like I it. Because it's not about you. Yes. It's not about you. At the exactly. same time, there's so many people out there that think, I could now go on the mission field or, or you know, yes. whatever. You know, and, and you come from a community that is not exactly mainstream in America. Right, right. So, yes, I, I'll, I'll be happy to share that. I just had to throw that one in because we get so caught up in who am I? Who, who am I? I got to figure out me and I got to figure out my purpose and this. And when we stop focusing on who am I and we focus on who God is, whose am I? I'm God. I belong to God. Anyways, we could go on with that forever, but... Uh, so I g actually grew up Amish. I grew up in the Amish com in an Amish community in Michigan, and I I mean I was a fairly good child mm -hmm. growing up, and I tried to play by the rules. And for those of you that you know know Amish, you know that they don't have technology, they don't have electricity, we don't have any of the modern conveniences. And I grew up in one of the, the strictest Amish communities, honestly. Uh, where, you know, everything we did had a rule. And so I was taught that if I don't follow these rules and if I don't obey my parents, that was a big one. If I don't obey my parents, then I'm going to hell. Um, and it was so bad that for, for a while, I couldn't talk about hell. It, it felt like a cuss word to me. Hell felt like a cuss word to me. Um... But at, you know, as a young teenager, I began to question everything. I'm like wondering, okay, is there anything else out there? Hmm. Is this the only way? Is this the only life? Sure. Um, but because of the stigma behind, you know, I saw one of my aunts leave. 
And the community just fell apart. Sure. It was just the end of the world. I thought somebody died. Right. That That's how they treated it. If somebody left, it was like mm-hmm. somebody died. And yet, to their credit, they do allow for that. Right? In my community? Oh, no. No. Oh, no. no. Get in. There no. are communities that, that do. do allow for that. And, but know, my but... community, they don't. Oh, it's, gotcha. it's not an option. And so because I had that stigma, I never thought it would be possible for me to leave because I don't want to go to hell. Right. Uh, so, but as I got older, I started rebelling. I started just because I noticed that over and over in my pattern, I can't be good enough. Right. No matter how hard I try, I mess up. So why even try? got to the point where I said, why even try? So Obviously, I, I'm going to hell. I might as well have fun then. Right. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I'm like, I can figure that out later. Mm-hmm. So uh, as a young teenager, I started rebelling. I started just being super um, disrespectful to my parents, really. And I started getting into, um, you know, doing parties, mm-hmm. drinking, which... Some people think it's unheard of in the Amish community. It's not. It's prevalent. They have yeah. teenagers just right. like you. Yep. No, right. <laughs> um, so I started drinking and going to parties. I had I had uh, headphones and a little iPod. Or iPod. I think it was like a little MP3 player. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the little white ones? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to hide it from my parents, of course, because if they yeah. found it, they destroyed it. Which my dad did after a while. He found it on my hiding spot unfortunately <laughs> and destroyed it but at the age of 18 I I was really so lost so broken and I, was, I just wanted something different I wanted something else and so I chose to run away I didn't I didn't you know tell mm-hmm. anyone in the community because if I did they would have tried to talk me out of it sure. and so one Sunday afternoon I, I ran away I left and in my mind, I'll just leave for two years and then I'll come back. Mm-hmm. Well, those two years went by and I did end up going back for a little bit, but I couldn't do it. I said, I, I know there's more out there. I can't live like this. And I heard enough about the Bible that I was convinced that I didn't have to live that religious life in order for God to love me or to, right. in order to go to heaven. Sure. So, But my problem was when I went back, I was running from my problems. Mm. I was running from my personal decisions that I had made. And so when I left again, I moved to North Dakota. (laughs) So you ran as far as you possibly could. Pretty much, uh, (laughs) which was seven years ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I will say it was one of the, aside from from Jesus, it was one of the best decisions I made because it led me on to the road that God had for me. Sure. And so when I moved here, I totally and completely submitted myself to God and I said God I don't know who you are I don't even know if you're good but I need to know what my purpose is mm. God because I, 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 I was so broken I didn't feel like I had a purpose I had pretty much my identity stripped from me because of sure past decisions yeah. um, so with that being said I just fully committed myself to God and I started going to church and the biggest thing I will tell you, I read my Bible. Mm. And I want to encourage you, read the Bible. Because the Bible is God's word, and it brings to life who he is. Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm a little bit reminded of how Jesus said, you know, you search the scriptures and hope and think that you have life in them. And it's not in them you find life, but it's in Jesus. Right. And the word of God, the Bible, directs you to Jesus. He's the moral of the story all right. throughout the Bible. Um, so with that being said, my life radically changed. I was baptized within three months because I knew it was the right thing to do. And I just was, I was sold out for Jesus. And I was telling everybody at work and people were like calling me Bible thumber. And um, I'm trying to think of the other things like church girl and Jane. Oh, that's all baloney. And mm-hmm. having atheists tell me that pff, that's all, you know. Yeah. But I wasn't, I wasn't swayed. Right. I was so convinced because of the experience I right. had with Jesus. Right. And him coming in at my lowest point and saving me when I couldn't save myself. Right. And growing up, we didn't know, but I didn't know about missions. Honestly, I was taught growing up that third world countries are scary. You don't ever go there. Wow. <laughs> 
Isn't that something? Because yeah. it's amazing to go to third world countries. And it is. The people are so lovely and so accommodating and it friendly. Is. And sure, there's lawlessness, but that's that's America for for heaven's sake, right? You but. think we don't have lawlessness <laughs> lawlessness here? Yeah. I said, no, you can figure out the places yeah, to yeah. go to find that. Join Sarah on the next trip, and you can find there out. There you go. So, yes. Absolutely. So uh, with that being said, I after you know com- just totally committing your life to Jesus and going to a church that actually talked a little bit about missions, mm-hmm. that's how I learned about missions and what it was. And uh, I soon was like, I want to do that. I want to go on a missions trip. And the first opportunity, I, by the time I called the pastor, they were already full. So I, but that didn't discourage me. Um, so that's like an encouragement for you guys. If you want to do missions and the first time it doesn't work, don't give up. It just wasn't the right time. And that's how I was. I was just like, oh, it's not the right time. Okay, cool. I'm waiting for the next opportunity. And within six months, I'm headed to the Philippines for two weeks. Sure. Absolutely, completely changed my life. And this is a joke I like to say. When I was in the Philippines, I was bit by some bug, and the bug gave me a virus, Mm -hmm. and I haven't found a cure for the virus, Mm. and I really hope I don't. The virus is doing missions. Yeah. Ah, uh, like what malaria? Is there something I should know? Is it contagious, Sarah? Did you, you know? uh, no, don't worry, I'm healthy. Yeah, yes. yeah, we got bit by the missions bug. Yes, yeah. and and I just I, I can't not go because that's my heart. It's uh, it's the Father's heart. He says, "Go into all the world," and yes, I do missions here. I I do outreaches here in my own city, whatever. And totally, you know, people ask me, are you open to do missions locally? Absolutely. Uh, but when God calls me to go, I go wherever that is. Right. Nice. <laughs> All right. So, Amish girl leaves at 18, <laughs> runs away, complete identity, because your whole identity is built yes. in that community. That's stripped away. You and come you to also... faith in Jesus Christ. Yeah. You go on the mission field and this whole new identity now. Is, is, is being built into you. Amen. I was going to say, and you also have to remember, or I also want to remind you that when I left, I was pretty much, you know, shunt from my community. Mm-hmm. My community, my family, because now I'm the bad person. If I come back to visit, it's they see me as the bad person. I'm, I'm the devil. I'm a really bad influence on everyone there. I've made a horrible decision. Um... So I had to work through that and figure out, I was just talking to one of my friends about receiving love. I didn't know what love was growing up at all. Hmm. I didn't understand love. I didn't feel loved. I didn't, um, you know, the the, the Amish community just have a different, has a different way of doing things. And and affection is not one of them or words words of encouragement at all. And so the most amazing thing about that is I allowed God to show me what love was. Not only did he show me how to be and receive love, mm-hmm. but how to give and love. Express it as well. Yes. The Father's heart. The Father's heart. <laughs> yes. All right. So uh, where are you going next? Because you're supposed to be on the mission field next month, right? That's yes. The plan. Where are you going? I am uh, planning to go to Nigeria the first part of February and then go to Colombia the last part of February. Wow. So, so going back to Colombia. Yeah, yes. back to Colombia, right, two yes. continents. Very, very excited. Mm-hmm. Uh, God really opened a whole lot of doors in Colombia from when we were there in November. Um, m- we had so many pastors calling and saying, can you come do a meeting for us? Can you come do trainings for us? And so that's been super, super cool. But I'm really excited for Nigeria, really, because I... Uh, the cool, cool part about Nigeria is we actually have um, a leader from Ethiopia, which is our key leader in Africa, okay. actually. And then we have a leader from Kenya and a leader from Uganda that are all planning to join me there. Nice. And so I'm really, really excited to see what God is going to do, not just because I'm there, but because these leaders are coming right. together. Yeah. So, yeah, so you've gone there, but now... God is raising up people from within who will then ultimately carry on that mission. Exactly. That's the whole point. And that's why we model what we model is because we don't want what we start, stop when we leave. 
Right. We need to train because the whole idea is training trainers. Right. And that's why the strategy that we use is so uh, transferable. It's very simple. Mm -hmm. First of all, I can't do complicated. <laughs> I need very simple fourth grade level <laughs> verbiage. And that works really, really good in these sure. countries because, um, first of all, you know, the language barrier. But because it's so simple, it's easy to transfer. Sure. And when, when you make it transferable, it continues to grow. It continues to expand to other people. It seems to me that sharing the gospel was never meant to be a complex thing. We've only <laughs> made it complex, haven't we? Yes. We have made it a very, very <laughs> complicated and complex right. thing when it is very simple. Very simple. Absolutely. So simple. Nice. So let me ask you a question then. Why should I go overseas when there's so many needs in my own community? That's a great question. Actually, I get that question all the time, mm -hmm. personally. Uh, for me, personally, I can only speak for me. Because I have been there. First of all, I see the great need. In Luke 10, Jesus is sending out his 72 disciples, and he gives them instructions. He tells them that the workers are few. So he's, he's like informing them, mm -hmm. listen, the workers are few. But then he tells them, but pray to the Lord of the harvest, mm -hmm. which is God. Sure. So he's saying, pray to God that he would send out more workers. Sure. Which to me is says a lot about Jesus. He's saying, you can't do this. You can't create more workers and you can't, mm -hmm. on your own, you can't convict people to go. Right. But pray and I can convict sure. the hearts. And so, you know, my, my prayer, my desire is not that you would go out of guilt, right? That you would go because, oh, well, Sarah said I probably should, so I guess I'll go. No, I want you to do it because you have a conviction to do it. Yeah. Get over your fears. Just, just go. Right. And just because there are other people aren't going doesn't stop you. Jesus still sent out the 70. Exactly. He didn't say, well, okay, let's pray and let's see if God sends some more workers. And if he does, well, then I'll send you out. He doesn't. Right, right. And you so know, we still go. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, the fact that the mission is so great here is not a lie. It's right. true. But when I go to these third world nations, I don't see a church on every street corner. Right. I see kids that don't have shoes or they can't go to school because they don't have shoes. Right. But they want to be in school. They want to go to school. The parents yeah. want to send them to yeah. school. But there's, you know, because of the, the uh, parasites in, in the dirt or whatever. Yep. Yeah, yeah, sure. If, if they don't have shoes, they're, right. they can't, they don't allow them to go to school. Sure. And I said, when I go, when I'm here, you talk about Minot, North Dakota. There's a church on every street corner plus some. And so, because my heart is to reach every person for Christ, and I want to see a church being planted where there never had been a church before, Americans have no excuse to not know Jesus. Right. We have so many resources. We have so many places to go and hear about Jesus. Right. It, there's a difference between choosing to be ignorant right. And just not knowing. Right. Absolutely. It's the human will. Yeah. Here, okay, hey, listen, we've grown up with Christianity, at least culturally, and people don't have as much of a will. But there are people yes. out there who say, hey, please come. Yes. Please tell us about Christ. Yes. Please help us. Yeah. How could we not? Right. How so could we not? I do it because I, God has convicted in my heart. I have been there and I've seen the need. And Jesus said to go. Right. He said, go unto all of the earth. All of the world. You know, you, you inspire me. I should We should buy like uh, an entire uh, shipping container full of flip flops. Oh, Do you man. Know what I mean? And just send them and just have them there so when you arrive, just start uh, handing out That shoes. would be Wouldn't amazing. That be amazing. <laughs> wow. But For then sure. you got to build schools to accommodate all the new kids who right. would be in there. So right. we need some teachers to go as well. Which is really awesome. You know, in uh, both in Nigeria and in Uganda, um, the pastors that I'm the one that I worked with in Uganda, the one that I'm going to work with in Nigeria, they were both donated land by local officials. Wow. Somebody just gave them land to do with whatever they want. The one in in, uh, in Uganda, they're building a school. Yeah. And so I got to sit down with these local political leaders and ask them questions. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what do you think about this project? 
and you know you gave them this land so what are your thoughts on it and they said we're just sitting at the edge of our seat to see what's going to happen with it because mm -hmm. they gave it to christian leaders right. they're expecting something great to happen right and that's interesting i think a lot of people don't understand that uganda is very christian friendly yes you know their yes. president is christian they um, have yeah. yeah uh you know they work very well with christian groups and, mm -hmm. and they're willing to to allow things to happen to mm -hmm. see because they they want the social development as well yes yes in <clears throat> in you know I'll, I'll just a really short story about this is one of the political leaders wasn't a christian in fact he would be the kind of um he comes from a religion that persecutes christians indeed they they exist there too <laughs> yes yeah, they, do. they do absolutely yep. and so the interesting thing about him is he made a statement he said you know it we know that without god this project's not gonna stand but with God, this project is going to continue and it's going to be a wonderful thing. And then he said there were foreigners that came through before and were a very bad influence on their kids. Sure. They, there was prostitution, there was perversion, unfortunately. And so he was a little bit skeptical about this. Sure. But then, you know, when he saw me and what I, what I want to do, but he said, I'm so encouraged that you are Christian leaders, that you're mm -hmm. Christian tr Christians trying to re bring something good into our right. community and he said I just want a good program for the children our children need it and there's hundreds of children in that in that little village right there that are orphans or they have parents who just can't provide for them and so I'm I'm super excited I I, I was there to see the land and now um, I personally sent some because I want to be a part of the project I sent some money to help them and they started digging and here's the awesome mm. thing i this just gets me so excited because when i was there and asking the leaders these questions they said i, I was like how are you going to help with this project and they said uh well once you start doing something we think that people are going to come and just donate bricks or they're going to mm. donate their time or something like that when they actually started digging they finally were able to hire somebody to come in and start digging locals started bringing bricks sure. and I saw two big piles of bricks and I'm like it's this is amazing a little bit of leadership yes you know it takes some form and definition it gets moving and, and people will, will kind of jump kind of like Nehemiah it sounds like a Nehemiah yes <laughs> yeah we just need to start mm -hmm. God can do so <laughs> much with our obedience yeah, absolutely yeah. so then uh, tell me about CMC Church Multiplication Coalition Correct. interdenominational group yes yeah, so, so CMC, uh, I got connected with them when I went on my first mission trip to the Philippines. They started back in 2006. There was a, a pastor from California and a pastor from the Philippines went to India. And they had a vision, a church planting vision when they were in the Philippines, or in India. They came back, the pastor, and they wanted to start it in the Philippines. The pastor from the Philippines presented it to his team because he was already doing ministry and he was doing crusades there. He presented the vision to his team and asked if they would be on board. And they said yes. And so since 2006, they've gone to many different nations with the vision. They, they uh, cast vision to local mm -hmm. leaders. So they, uh, once you enter a, a, a new area, right, you find a connection. You find a person that, a person of peace like Jesus told the disciples. Absolutely. Yep. So we go in and we find a person of peace. Hospitable and, people that are willing to, yeah. Yes, and then we try to connect with the local pastors, get them together, present the vision to them, and these can be from all different uh, denominations. Yep. So we present that, and if they're wanting, willing to work with us, we'll come in and work with them, we'll train them, we'll, mm -hmm. uh, if we need to, we'll present some kind of material. And also something that they're very, very, uh, I don't know the right word for it, but I could just say, so something else that uh, they tell people is we are not a church. We don't, they don't have a church building. Right. They don't have some warehouse. Right. And so any 
funds that they get goes directly into the field. field. Right. So I like this because, okay, so CMC is not a particular church group. They're a coalition of Christians. Yes. But their vision is to see churches planted. Yes. Because in the mission field, the best chance a community has is in planting a church, not just going and doing relief work. Yes. They need a church. Yes. That's their best sustainability. Mm -hmm spiritually mm -hmm. is if a church planted and that's yeah. what you guys are doing yes and so the way they started that is you know first of all bringing unity within the pastors and then say hey guys so this is the map we have a church in this village we have a church in this village but look in between here there isn't one and over here there's another village that doesn't have a church how can we all collectively work together we're gonna pick a person who is gonna reach this village and then we're all gonna work together with this leader mm -hmm and reach the village and then you know if, if there's a church planted we the leader is going to to pastor the church mm -hmm. and we also teach them how to uh uh words are not coming to me today that, that's okay that's okay <laughs> um we can edit all of this yes. no, that's fine. No. <laughs> um so we teach them how to help each other. Yeah. There's five core leadership skills that we try to teach them. And one of them is how to, if you have, so let's say you have five pastors here. And one of those pastors is going to reach this village. But he doesn't have a vehicle. He doesn't have transportation. But you have a pastor over here that does. Mm -hmm. We encourage him, okay, you help this pastor with transportation. Yeah. Maybe they want to show a film. This pastor over here has the equipment for that sure so he's gonna bring the equipment to show the film so the idea yep. is that we're all working together because yep. um, the other idea is if you have so many pastors who are trying to reach the same village by themselves you might have churches popping up right next to each other sure and competing exactly and, you know, and, competing <laughs> right and it's, it's all the father's field yes I may work in one corner you in another corner but there are times where we step over the line and we yeah yeah co-labor Yes, co-laboring, so, cool. co-laboring together. Yep, absolutely. Know. Okay, so, all right, so try to put all this together, <laughs> right? A young Amish girl, you, you leave the Amish community, you, you come to faith in Christ, you go on the mission field, you've been in all these different countries and all these things going on. You just came out of Uganda, now you're heading over to Nigeria and then Colombia after. Yes. It takes finances. Yes. Well, let's talk about missions and finances Ooh. you know let's let's <laughs> let's go there you nobody know. wants to talk about that and yet it needs to be talked about yes you know because there are there are varying philosophies and there are those who overtly beg in jesus name i <laughs> yes. suppose and then there are those who are more like paul who you know who who work their trade if you would mm -hmm. you know obviously mm -hmm. paul was a, a leather worker a tent maker mm -hmm. right worked alongside priscilla and aquila of course in mm -hmm. corinth and mm -hmm. and 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 provided for himself and and those he worked with and 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 paul wasn't a burden to the corinthian church at all mm -hmm. he didn't take any money and yet there were other churches who hearing that paul was there in corinth you know the macedonian churches so philippi and thessalonica mm -hmm. they provided to him while he was there I want to go there if that's okay. <laughs> yes, of course. So how do you how do you personally how do you raise funds? So personally, I don't actually do fundraising anymore, and the reason behind that is I, you know, this is just me, mm -hmm. and I I read how Paul did that. What you just talked about, and and he said he didn't want to be a burden to the church, but the church that was providing for him he commended them for it like you are faithful and you have done this and so I also what put me over the edge for that was reading Amy Carmichael's story and I know we're talking about Amy Carmichael again. that's okay I mean you know <laughs> um but she so early on in her ministry that something happened you know she was trying to raise funds for something and, but she got to a place in her life where she said she didn't want people to give because they felt bad for her. So she didn't want them to give out of guilt. She wanted to, them to give because they desired to give. And they wanted to see something happen. You know, whatever project she was doing, their heart was in it. They were a part of the project. It wasn't just, oh, I'm an American. I got money. And um, I will feel good if I just give some money. Right. I did my good deed for the day. <laughs> right, you know? yeah, right. So my heart really is, you know, I don't want people to give out of guilt. 
I don't want people to give because they think it's a good thing to do or it's Mm -hmm. a duty as a believer. I want people to give because they're passionate about it, because they desire to see God's work, God's will being fulfilled. So I bake. (laughs) Uh, Bake, not beg, because they they sound similar in the Dakotas. (laughs) And between your accent and the Dakotas, they sound very similar. Sarah bakes. She yes. doesn't beg. Okay. <laughs> I go on the street and beg. Just kidding. So I love to bake. You know, as an, a little Amish girl, you know, it's automatic that we're, we learn how to bake. Oh, do you ever? We, we learn how to cook and all that. I actually didn't like it when I was younger. Mm. I despised being in the kitchen. I would have much rather been outside with the horses. Oh, you were a rebel from the very beginning. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but... I learned, you know, regardless, I still learned it. I, it was expected. It was a requirement. And so after I left, I, I didn't bake or do much for quite a while, actually, because I'm like, huh, no, I don't have to. <laughs> but then I started baking just kind of for myself, mostly. And then um, when I was, uh, this was back in 2015, I believe, or 2016, one of my coworkers asked me to make a loaf of bread. I was like, oh, okay, sure, yeah. I mean, I know how to do it. Why not? And she really wanted one. So I made one for her, and she just couldn't stop talking about how good it was. And then she planted a seed in me to say, you should do this for, like, the farmer's market, or you should sell this stuff. And so I thought about it. I'm like, eh, do I really want to? I don't think I'm that – I like baking that much. But – I had enough coworkers that would always compliment me on my cooking, my baking. So finally, I was like, okay, sure. And I started doing the farmer's market. Man, sold out almost every time. Uh, And if I didn't sell out, I had people that would take it. So that's how I got my passion for baking. I realized that, man, I actually really like doing this. It's therapeutic for me. And so in... The beginning of 2020, when I came back from being overseas for a year, I decided to take all the proceeds from my baking and put it into missions. So I don't take any income, anything that I make from baking mm-hmm. goes into a missions fund, and it's either to support myself or it's yeah. to support somebody I believe in that is going into missions. So you're following the Pauline model then. Yeah, <laughs> I guess. A true story, right? Yeah. Uh, God's yeah. not broke. Right. And then I appreciate what you say. Um, you know, sure, somebody wants to support, that's great, but I really want their heart to be in it. Yeah. Not mm-hmm. not out of guilt. Yes. Right? Yes. But willingly. God loves a cheerful giver, as what Paul said to the Corinthians. Yes. This is the heart that we should have, you know. Yes. Uh, not that I seek to gain from you, but the fruit that abounds to your account. Mm-hmm. You know, you're providing mm-hmm. an opportunity mm-hmm. for people to put their heart into something. Yeah. Not just their finances, right. but who really want to do this. Right, right. You see, there's all the difference in the world. Amen. That's that's so true. And I will tell you, <laughs> since I've been doing that, I have never lacked a penny to do missions. I'm not rich by any means. I don't have a ton of money sitting somewhere. No, I've seen your car. It's not... <laughs> It's nothing special. <laughs> I don't, yeah. Um, so all that to say that I live on faith and God has provided every single time because I believe that if God wants me to go, he'll provide. And if that means I need to work extra, hey, I have hands. I can right. use them. I can work. Sure. I. Well said. Yeah. Using what God's given you already. Amen. Sure. Yes, exactly. All right. So if somebody wants more information, Sarah, maybe they've seen the video, they're going to hear the radio broadcast. They want to kind of get in touch with you and, and, and learn more, maybe get involved, go on the mission field. How, how can that be arranged? How can people contact you? Yes, good question, actually. Or if they want to try some of your baked wares. Ooh, <laughs> you know, I would love to bake for you. <laughs> um, so baking, I have a Facebook account, Sarah's Dutch Oven, and... You can go on there and order stuff through that or uh, through my personal contact. And I take orders. So what you see on my Facebook page isn't all that I make. So if you have a special request, just let me know. Um, And for my personal contact, so if you feel let to give and you want to, you have a desire to, reach out to me or I have Venmo, PayPal. Sure. What's your um, email? 
My email is sarahtroyer65 at gmail.com. All right, Sarah Troyer, S A R A H T R O Y E R, mm -hmm. at 65 at gmail. Oh, Sarah Troyer, 65 at gmail. Yes. Okay, so people can get in contact with you. I, I yes. probably wouldn't want to put your phone number over the air unless you want to, but you yeah, know. that's okay. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, you know. <clears throat> but there you have Venmo and stuff. I encourage people. Uh, mm -hmm. Hit her uh, Facebook page, check it out, and and you'll see pictures there of some of the stuff you've made because I've seen it. Yes. it shows up in my feed. Kind oh, of regularly. so <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. you know, but more than anything, uh, know God's heart for the mission field, and, yes. and see what what's happened in Sarah's life as she's sort of followed that that path as as she's understood God's heart and gone out. Uh, that you might get the same heart yourself. Amen. You know, life is short game, and you don't want to die with regrets. And I only encourage you to do this, to imagine yourself on your deathbed and make all your decisions from that perspective. What would you regret doing and what would you regret not doing? Because in the end, nobody regrets going on the mission field. Nobody regrets sharing the gospel. Nobody regrets expending their energies and their, their finances uh, for the sake of God's kingdom. But many have left this earth and regretted not getting involved. And we don't want you to be one of them. Yes. We want to see you motivated we want to see you mobilized we want to see you out there sharing the gospel there's an entire world out there that needs yes. to hear it you have the answer to the uh, to the the issue of the human heart amen i would love to bring people with me on the uh, on the mission field so if that's on your heart and you just don't know where to start you don't know what to do please reach out to me i uh, i would i can connect you with people you can go with, come with me on one of the missions Either way, your excuse to not know where to start should not stop you. Absolutely. It shouldn't be an excuse anymore. Absolutely. Maybe is what I'm trying to say. Sure, and if you need to get a hold of Sarah and you can't, you can contact the KFLK yes. studio here in Calvary Chapel, Minot. We would be more than happy to get you in direct contact with her. But uh, listen, love loud. Amen. All right. That is the truth. Anything <laughs> yeah. else you want to share, Sarah? I would just say, you know, in closing, I just really want to encourage you to to really think about it. You know, like like Pastor Bill said, I have noticed, I'm like from my observation, the main reason not more Americans go into the mission field or even just go overseas, leave their own country, is because of fear. And the fear could be different things. The fear of the unknown. Sure. I don't know what what's going to happen. I don't know how to act in a different culture. Mm. I don't know what to do. Or another thing is, when it comes to missions, people don't think they can make a difference. Right. They don't feel like they can make enough of a difference that it would be worth it. And I'm here to tell you, that is a lie. Absolutely. I don't care if you go for one week, for two weeks, for a month. You can make a difference. And I want people to get that. Because if the only thing that is stopping you from going is you don't think that little you can make a difference, we right. we can actually do like get rid of that whole thing right. by taking you on a missions field. On the yeah. mission field. Well there you go. There you go. Jesus told us to go out. Yes. Right? And yes. the Great Commission is and to go out into all the world. It takes <clears throat> sacrifice. It does. It does. It, it, but but meaning is found in the sacrifice. Yes, right? absolutely. Fulfillment, contentment mm -hmm. are the byproducts of, of living the life that God has called us to live. Yes. It's yes. not something we pursue. It's something we receive when we pursue Him. Amen. Very true. All right, gang. Well, that's just a few minutes. We've got to have Sarah back here. Uh, <laughs> that is for sure. Uh, we'll have you back when you come back from Nigeria okay. and Colombia. Want to hear what's going on. Absolutely. And uh, hey, be blessed. All right? Yes. But follow hard after Jesus Christ. Amen. And live the life he's called you to live. You are called.